Welcome back everybody, Rob from Crown of Thorns with yet another video for you. And it's been a great day, uh, an epic day of filming. It is now 3.30 on March 6th. I think this is the fourth or fifth video that I've filmed so far today. And I've still got a few more to go. Uh, but I'm having a great time and all of these videos, and I, I'm gonna try to um, have them premiere in a particular order so that it makes a little more sense. But all of them are gonna be able to fit together really nicely. It's, it's amazing how it worked out. That's that's God's work, not mine. Um, how they all ha have a, a, a common thread amongst all of them. And they all kind of harken back to my videos about Shemitah Cycle, the Four Blood Moons, uh, the Jubilee, uh, all that kind of stuff. Just. Uh, I, I encourage you to go back and watch some of those videos, but definitely these this batch of videos that I'm filming today that will start coming out starting March, Sunday, March 10th, from that forward. Just please watch all of them because it's all going to make one great big picture. All right? So anyway, let's get started. Uh, Fago Twist. It's kind of like their version of 7-Up. It's pretty good. It's not bad. And you can get four of these cans at Dollar Tree for $1.25. I mean, you can't beat that. It's like, what, 30 cents a can or something? Good stuff. Anyway, I know soda's not the best thing to drink, but it's the only thing that I had in my refrigerator that was cold. So there it is. And I don't mind having a soda so often, every so often. So today we're talking about no water needed. No water needed. And this has come up in a lot of the questions and comments lately, so I thought I would address this, uh, make a video unto itself regarding this. I've talked about it many times, about how our salvation is by faith alone, that we do not need to be baptized. You don't need to be baptized, okay? If you want to do that afterwards, fine. After you get saved, I mean. Then fine, but uh, baptism has zero nothing to do with your salvation and baptism will not save you now we're going to see in times past baptism did play a part in our salvation not ours but in salvation but in our dispensation of grace uh no water needed no water needed all right we're going to take a look at that now salvation is dispensational there is dispensational salvation. How people got saved way back in the Old Testament is different than how we get saved now or even how people got saved uh, under Peter or even uh, uh, under Jesus or John the Baptist. Okay. Now, the thing to remember is this. Uh, people were still under the law all the way up until Paul. The dispensation of grace that we are in starts with Paul and will run all the way to the rapture, okay? So when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those, even though they're in your Old Testament, they are Old Testament books. Remember, the Bible says uh, a New Testament begins with the death of a testator. Well, who is the testator? That was Jesus. His death begins the New Testament. So everything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John up to the point where Jesus dies is Old Testament. Old Testament. You have to keep that in mind. So the Gospels are predominantly Old Testament. And people were still under the law. And people still had to do faith plus works for their salvation. In our dispensation of grace under Paul's ministry, we are saved by faith alone. I'm going to look at that. But in times past and in the future, it will be and was faith plus works. Okay? In the Old Testament, they had to bring in animal sacrifice. They had to keep the commandments. All right? Those are works. All right? Under John the Baptist, what was he saying? Repent and get baptized. That's a work. Getting baptized is a work. Uh, repenting in, in the sense of turning away from your sin uh, is, a, is a work. 
it's 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 a, 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 a it's a change of mind. But when they were talking about repent, a lot of times back then, it wasn't just the the turning away from sin. You had to get clean. You had to get clean first. You know, get rid of your sin and now come. I'm glad it's not like that anymore. Under Jesus, it was still faith plus works. I'm going to write this down. John the Baptist, faith plus works. You had to be baptized. I'll just put that. Be baptized. And get clean. All right. Under Jesus, what did he tell the rich young ruler? Sell all your stuff. He told another guy, hey, pick up your cross and follow me. He told another guy, hey, you want to get to heaven? Keep all the commandments. And Jesus also preached uh, baptism. So it was well, under Jesus, still under the law, faith plus works, baptism, Keep the commandments. That's different than what we have now, that's for sure. What about under Peter? This is what trips up all the Catholics. They stop in Acts chapter 2. They never go any farther than that. And so they think that our salvation rests upon Peter's ministry. And they're under this false notion that Jesus was saying that the church would be built upon Peter, and that's not what Jesus was saying at all. But I'm not going to get into that right now. But anyway, under Peter, it was still faith plus works. You had to repent and be baptized in order to get saved. Baptized. Those are works. If you have to do something, you know, keep a commandment, uh, get baptized, whatever, those are works, okay? And we're going to see that Acts is this transitional book. And that's where we're going to be throughout this study is in the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book. And I've talked about that before, but I'll put it up here again. What does that mean? Well, Acts is transitioning, okay? Excuse me. From the Jews to the Gentiles. Remember, Jesus came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And Peter went solely to the Jews. Well, until later in his ministry. But predominantly, Peter was going to the Jews. John the Baptist went to the Jews. Jesus to the Jews. Peter to the Jews. But in the book of Acts, we see that start to transition. That starts to change. Okay, it's transitioning from Peter to Paul. And we see that. The first part of Acts is all about Peter. And then it slowly starts to transition to where, by the time we get to the end of it, Paul's the predominant character in the book. And finally, it's transitioning from law to grace. Okay, so if you were born or living during the time of John the Baptist, Jesus, or Peter, and you were under their ministries, then yes, baptism would have been necessary for your salvation. But we're going to see how that changes. We're going to see how that changes. Uh, go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. We'll see what Peter's early ministry looked like. Acts chapter 2, 38. I think I already read that one, but let's read it again. <laughs> Just because... Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So what did you have to do to get saved? Repent and get baptized. There we are. All right. Now go to Acts chapter 10. And we're going to look at verse, verses 44 through 48. Now, to give a little bit of context, Peter is instructed to go see this Roman soldier named Cornelius. Uh, Cornelius was a Roman soldier, but he wanted the true God. 
and he knew that it was through the Jews. Remember, Jesus said, salvation is of the Jews. So Cornelius knew that. Like, if I want what they have, if I want the one true God, I got to find out what these Jews are doing. And how do I get to that point? Well, it starts to change. Cornelius was a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. And remember, the disciples were sent out to the Jews. Peter's ministry was to the Jews. That starts to transition a little bit. Toward the end, he's, he's going to uh, Gentiles. But predominantly, it was for the Jews. So anyway, he goes to Cornelius' house to help, these, help him and his family to get saved. And this is what happens, starting in verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as, as well as we? That's different. Here in Acts 2, Peter's saying, Hey, if you want to get saved, you better repent and get baptized, and then you can get saved. That's how you'll get saved. Right? By the time you get to Acts chapter 10, toward the end of, well, I don't know if it's the end of his ministry, but this was kind of an anomaly. Most of his ministry was to the Jews. Anyway, when you get to Acts chapter 10, which was probably getting toward the end of Peter's ministry, at that point in Acts chapter 10, they didn't have to get baptized in order to get saved. He said that the Holy Spirit fell on them and what then prevented them from getting baptized. So instead of baptized and then saved, like it was here, in Acts chapter 10, it's the opposite. They were saved, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and then if they wanted to, they could get baptized. It was changing. It's a transitional book. Why don't the Catholics see that? <laughs> Why don't they see that? Why don't they go past Acts chapter 2? And it's not just the Catholics. There's a lot of Protestant denominations that still believe you have to be baptized in order to get saved. The, the Church of Christ people. And, and I'm not trying to be mean. Uh, I know people from the Church of Christ. They're good people. They're nice. Uh, the, the guys from Duck Dynasty. I love that show. They're, they belong to the Church of Christ. They believe that you have to get baptized in order to get saved. Why? Because they're reading their Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they're only going to Acts chapter 2. What happens in Acts chapter 10? It's the exact opposite. You don't need water to get saved. Why don't they get to that point? I don't get it. Or this next guy we talked about, Philip. Why don't they get it there? Definitely, why don't they get it under Paul? who wrote two-thirds of our New Testament, who is the apostle to the Gentiles, to us. And Paul makes it clear, it's faith alone. See what happens if you don't rightly divide? If you don't get your doctrine straight? If you stop here in Acts chapter 2, and you believe that your baptism has something to do with your salvation, you're not saved. And I hate to say that, but it's the truth. You're not saved. All right, so it changed even under Peter. Early part of his ministry to the later part of his ministry, it changed. All right, let's look at Philip. Go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. All right, and we'll start in verse 27. All right, and he, Philip, arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship was returning and sitting in his chariot, reading Isaiah the prophet. So this Ethiopian sitting in his chariot, reading the scriptures of Isaiah. All right. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He's saying, Hey, I see you're reading Isaiah. Do you understand what you're reading? And he, the Ethiopian, said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. Okay, this is obviously a prophecy about Jesus. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. 
And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So he's picking up in Isaiah and going right through the scriptures and he's showing how this prophecy uh, was fulfilled. How all these prophecies that pointed toward this Messiah, the Savior, it leads right to this man named Jesus. So Philip shows this Ethiopian that. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? In other words, why can't I get baptized? Is there any reason that I can't go into that water and get baptized? He's asking. Philip answers, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Does that sound like you have to get baptized first to get saved? No, he's saying if you're saved, if you're trusting already, then you can get baptized. So again, it's not the same as what it was here, here, and the early part of here. Philip is saying, no, if you are saved, now you can get baptized, not the other way around. Right? So, verse uh, 38, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Here's another thing. Acts 8.37, the verse, the key verse there. Acts 8.37. Which makes it clear that you don't need to be baptized in order to get saved. In all your new perversions, that verse is either missing or I'll have a note next to it saying this isn't reliable. It's probably not accurate. Some sort of a disclaimer. Only the King James Bible retains this verse. And that's another reason. They say, oh, the, the, the new perversions, they don't, they don't change up doctrine. That is just one example of how it does change up doctrine. If you have a new perversion and you don't have that verse or you have some sort of disclaimer telling you to ignore it, then you're going to still believe that you have to get baptized in order to get saved. Acts 8.37, which is only preserved in the King James Bible, makes it clear that baptism is not required for salvation. So don't tell me there aren't doctrinal changes in the new perversions. That's just one example. There's many others. I've done videos on that. So that's important, first and foremost. Use a King James Bible. That is where God preserved his word. I've done videos on that. You can check those out. But anyway, it's showing too. There's this transition, just like, actually we went kind of forward and then back, but it doesn't matter. Just like here for Philip, we see it again later in Acts chapter 10 with Peter. The same with Philip is with Peter, is what I meant to say. It was changing. It's a transitional book. The works part of it is falling out. The works are falling away. In fact, we could put that too as far as another transition from works, well, faith plus works, I guess, from faith plus works to faith alone. Faith alone. This is all transitioning, all in this book of Acts. Acts is a very, very important book. Um, but for some reason, people either they don't understand it or they just stop in Acts chapter 2. I don't know what they're doing. But th you need to read all the way through it. You see how it's starting to transition. Okay, I hope you're seeing that. All right. Now, we finally get to Paul toward the end of Acts and we start to see that he becomes the main character. And he has uh, been appointed by Jesus, God, as the apostle to the Gentiles who ushers in this dispensation of grace, okay? Where our salvation is by faith alone. Faith alone. No works. Faith alone. No works. Okay? Faith alone. No works. I hope you can read that. Um... Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 8 and 9. 
most people should know this or be familiar with it. And this is Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, speaking to us, the church. This is what he says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation and this dispensation under the ministry of Paul, which is where we are, we're not under the ministry of Jesus or Peter or John the Baptist. Now, that doesn't mean we don't recognize Jesus as our Lord and Savior and as God in the flesh. We do. But he appointed Paul to be the minister, the, the apostle to the Gentiles. And he gives us his gospel. We're going to look at that in a second and how we're to get saved. But here he tells us it is a faith alone by grace, not of works, not of works. So that means uh, repenting and keeping commandments and getting baptized. All this stuff is out. If you're relying on any of that, even 1% for your salvation, you are not saved. You must trust 100% on what Jesus did. 100% on what Jesus did and 0% on what you do, done, have done, will do, whatever else. It's 100% what Jesus did. That's where you put your trust. By faith alone. All right? Uh, go to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 14. Which says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Paul only baptized two people. Uh, and it probably was just out of uh, just because he he, he uh, knew them so well. Um, and he did that, I'm sure, I'm certain, he did that after they got saved. Okay? They got saved and then they wanted to be baptized and Paul was like, all right, I'm going to make an exception. I'll, I'll baptize you too. But Paul says, predominantly, that he baptized no one. Well, what kind of a minister, what kind of a good guy would Paul be to not baptize anyone if baptism was a part of salvation? Wouldn't that be a horrible thing on Paul's part? If, if, if salvation was still based on some works, say baptism, and Paul knew that, like, okay, I, I, in order for you to get saved, you need to be baptized, but then he didn't baptize anyone? What a horrible person he would be, right? The reason he didn't baptize anyone and was thankful that he didn't baptize anyone is because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And he wanted to make that point that it was by works alone. I'm sorry, by faith alone, not of works. Your salvation is by faith alone, not of works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And Paul made that clear. And that's why he didn't baptize anyone except for those two guys. All right. So now, where do we go from this? The other thing that people will do, because they tend to skip or jump over Paul, or they don't know what to do with Paul, so they just kind of stick him away in a corner someplace. They, they, they run back to the Gospels. They run back to the early part of Acts, and then they jump ahead to James. And James, of course, says that faith without works is dead. Go to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 20 through 26. All right. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? I'm just going to jump to verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So James is saying, faith without works is dead. He's saying that your salvation is still, or is going to be, faith plus works. Well, who's right and who's wrong? Is Paul wrong or is James wrong? Is one of them stupid? One of them a liar? None of the above. They're both right. But this is where your dispensationists come in. And this is where I talk about dispensational salvation. See, under this here, especially from Peter back, it was still faith plus works. Okay? Until the end, like we talked about. Under Paul, it's faith alone, not of works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We just saw that. So why is James saying faith plus works? Well, let's go back to James 1, 1. And this is where dispensations comes in. See, let's take a look at this. Stop here first. Go to Hebrews Chapter 1. It's just the, the, the book right in front of James. Hebrews 1, 1, and 2. 
says, Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. In other words, Hebrews, written by Paul, is saying, God speaks to different people at different times in different ways. That's why your Bible say in times past, but now, and things to come, because there's a differentiation. There were dispensations in the Old Testament. There are dispensations in the New Testament. And we're in this dispensation of grace. Okay? These folks here were still under that dispensation of law that was brought in by Moses. Okay? The tribulation period, which is coming after we rapture out, is its own dispensation. During the tribulation, your salvation will be faith plus works. You have to have faith in Christ, and you have to do two very important works. Not take the mark and have your head cut off. Pretty big. All right? So James, who is he talking to since God says, hey, you know what? Some of this Bible is written for these people and some is written for these people. And I always say, all of the Bible is written for us, but only Romans through Philemon, the books of Paul, are written to us. So who is James talking to? Paul was talking to us because he was ministering to us, the Gentiles. Who was Paul talking or I'm sorry, who was James talking to? Well, he says it in the very first line of his book. James 1.1 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. Who is he writing to? The twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Who are the twelve tribes? The Jews. James is writing to the Jews who will be going through the tribulation period. In which case, like I said, during the tribulation, it goes back to faith plus works and that's why James says, faith without works is dead. Because during that tribulation period, you've got to have faith and you've got to do your works. See, when you, when you recognize the biblical truth of dispensations, all of this will start to make more sense. You'll see why Peter was faith plus works. Why Jesus, faith plus works. Why John the Baptist, faith plus works. Why Paul is faith alone. And why James talking about out in the future is faith plus works again because of dispensations because of how God deals with different people in different ways at different times remember during the tribulation God goes back to dealing with the Jews there will be Gentiles there too but God is dealing primarily with the Jews it's the 70th week of Daniel do you see how this all makes sense and pulls together that's why James is saying hey to the 12 tribes because God's dealing with the Jews during that tribulation period and it will be faith plus works. So it's not that James is wrong or stupid or ignorant, and neither is Paul. They're just speaking to different people at different times. Paul's speaking to us, the church, in our dispensation of grace. James, talking to the Jews who will be going through that future tribulation. That's why. All right? So I hope that this clears up some of those questions and comments that have been coming in. Uh, because people have argued with me about this, about, oh no, you need to be baptized. It says it right here in Acts 2.38. Oh, it says it right here where Jesus and John, and they said this. And it's hard to explain to people in a, in a message about dispensations and everything I've just talked about in the past 30 minutes. I mean, it'd be a really long message, right? So I try to encapsulate it as best I can, but I thought, I'm just going to make a video about it I'm going to make a video about it, and hopefully that will clear it up for some people. All right? Excuse me. So, with that being said, Paul being our apostle, and he says it's by faith alone, no works, then how do I get saved? How do we get saved? All right? Paul gave us his gospel by which we are saved in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Let's take a look at it. 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 
by which also ye are saved. He's saying this is the gospel by which you are to get saved. Right here. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, okay, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. All right? The death, burial, and resurrection. For delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We are saved by trusting 100% on the finished work of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. Taking it one step farther, Romans 3.25. All right. Go to Romans chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 25. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. Talking about Jesus. He's our propitiation, a substitute. Through faith in his blood. Faith in his blood. So many times I hear people talk about how to get saved. And never once do they mention the blood. It's always ask Jesus into your heart. Or say a sinner's prayer. Or get baptized. Or keep the commandments. Or do this, do this, do this. Remember, not of works. Faith alone. Trust. Trusting is the only thing you can do that is not a work. Trusting in what? The death, burial, resurrection, but specifically that atoning blood. Jesus shed his blood so that our sins could be washed away. When you trust on that blood, all of your sins are forgiven. It's as though they never existed. Past, present, future, sins are gone. Now, that's not a free pass to sin, and there's still going to be natural consequences for your sin, and you can still be uh, uh, punished, so to speak, or reprimanded by God for your sins because they are of your body. Your body's not saved. Your soul is saved, but your soul is permanently saved, so you cannot lose your salvation, and we see that in Ephesians 1.13. Ephesians 1.13. Let's turn there. Ephesians 1.13. Which says, In whom ye also trusted, afterward that ye heard the word of truth, thy gospel of your salvation. See how this all comes full circle? In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Once you are saved, you are always saved. And people say, oh, so now I'm saved. I just go out and kill 10,000 people. No big deal. Well, technically, yeah, your soul is still saved. You're still going to go to heaven. But no big deal? No. You're going to be consequenced. Probably naturally, you'll either go to jail for the rest of your life or maybe you'll be killed yourself. Uh, but also, God is going to uh, punish you in one way or another. And, and because you have the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to have a guilty conscience. You're going to feel it. Okay? So it's not an excuse to sin, but you can take assurance in knowing that even when you do sin, you're still saved. Because it's all about what Jesus did and 0% about what you did, done, or will do. All right? Uh, so anyway, that is that. That's what I wanted to talk about regarding um, no water needed. Because, again, a lot of questions have come in. And it kind of worked out well. Again, this is the hand of God. It worked out perfectly with the rest of these videos that I'm going to be filming or have already filmed uh, today. Which is, is just amazing. All of them are going to tie together so nicely. I hope you'll watch all of them uh, to get this great big picture. But anyway, guys, any questions or comments, please leave them below. Uh, I thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, you guys take care. God bless.